Welcome back to What the Theory with Joel. I'm Joel, and this is the last in the discussion of the different modes of life according to Soren Kierkegaard in our discussion about existentialism. If you haven't checked it out, please look through the channel. You'll see the previous episodes. And if you want to get all caught up, I would suggest you watch those two before you come to this one. All right. So in the last episode, which was the three stages of life, we spoke about uh, living the aesthetic life, which is basically uh, pleasure-seeking, uh, living a life that's interesting um, as a way of you know maximizing infinite possibilities then you've got the ethical life which is about necessity it's about being grounded and being serious and living according to the dictates of the life around you but having it in an earnest way now between those two modes of life we found that things could be let's say unsatisfactory and so the proposition here is that the ethical way of life doesn't allow you to you know, fully be sure that what you've committed yourself to is actually correct. The aesthetic form of life prevents you from committing to anything, and so you never really become uh, something. You're just sort of um, partaking of life. You're taking rather than providing something, other than maybe having an interesting life. So the religious form of life is a leap of faith, and that leap of faith comes from a place of despair. And it's sort of a, a double movement. And when I talk about it being a double movement, it is a giving up of a certain part of yourself so that you can retain a truer part of yourself. Now, the example that um, we'll use is the one of Abraham. So for those of you who are quite familiar, um, you know Abraham is called the father of faith. Why? Because you know, he, it was promised to him by God that he would be the father of many nations. But he proved his faith uh, when the one son that was promised to him, Isaac, um, God asked for him to murder. And now the idea that Kierkegaard tries to get into is a lot of people have figured out many different things. They're understanding um, gravity. They're understanding the concept of the atom. They're understanding, you know, all manner of um, interesting things, impressive things about the world. He's still stuck on understanding Abraham. And in understanding Abraham, the question is, what was Abraham thinking when God asked him to go kill his son on the top of a mountain? And as Abraham walked up that mountain with his son, he had to have an imagination that what he was going to do was gruesome, that he was intentionally going to drive a knife into his son's heart. And he had to both believe that he was going to lose his son, that he was going to give up um, his son's life, and also not lose his child. If that doesn't make sense, then you're understanding it. <laughs> the weird thing about faith is it goes beyond the realm of the rational. It goes beyond the realm of, I guess, the explicable. You have to give up something in order for you to gain it and fully own it. And that's the idea behind this. Now, in order for someone to become a true person of faith, according to um, these ideas, it's you don't just become a knight of faith. By knight, I mean like, you know, a uh, knight like Sir Arthur. You don't become a knight of faith simply by making that leap. You first go through the, being a knight of infinite resignation. Now, the knight of infinite resignation renounces everything worldly, looks around and says that, well, even if I was to be aesthetic and try and enjoy all these pleasures, they are fleeting. They are not complete and as a human being, yes, I am flesh and blood, but I am also more. I have a conception of a further reality. I have a conception of a greatness, an infinite, and I need something to feed that part of myself. And so fixating myself with the things that are material and worldly is not going to satisfy myself. Similarly, if you're an ethicist, you might be living according to ethical traditions, but they could also be wrong. They're just as, you know, I guess, agreed upon by flesh and blood as you know, even the pleasures that we enjoy, it's just that your body more readily informs you of those pleasures than, say, what tradition tells you to do. That's more the wisdom in terms of if you're to live life in this society, you need to do things a certain way. You sort of have to become a stranger to um, the world of finitude. You're unaffected by its sorrows and desires. To the outside world, you might appear just like everyone else. You're not a person who's remarkable. You're not... Um, you know, you could be an accountant, you could be someone who just goes daily about their lives. There's nothing about what they, an outside person sees you doing 
that would inform them to the fact that you are knight of infinite resignation. But you, you're still sort of cutting all the roots around you. You engage with the world and you're not of the world. Uh, I think that's what the, the Bible even talks about in terms of you being in this world but not of this world. You're engaging, you're in the marketplace, you're, you understand discourse, you laugh, you have a family, all those things, but still your ultimate value is not from this world. You're, you're sort of hinged upon something else that is greater for you and that thing gives you meaning in order for you to start your family, to live your life, to have your business. It motivates everything about you. And that's a sort of reversal in terms of your path towards becoming a person of faith. You're no longer looking at your appetites and your ideas as being the lead thing for you to enjoy and measure life. You're no longer looking at the morals and ethics of your society as your way of judging and saying that life is good. Instead, you look to something greater. Now, Kierkegaard was a Christian, but he was a very <laughs> unique Christian. Um, you know, he spent a lot of his time talking about um, growing up in Denmark and living in Denmark, he was sort of giving this, there's this um, funny little <laughs> quip he gives around how he thinks the world will end. And he was equating theaters to churches. And we're saying he thinks the world will end when a clown comes out on the stage and screams that, you know, the theater is on fire and people will keep laughing. And that's how the world will end with laughter. Instead of taking things seriously, they sort of mock those things. And if you try and press through his work, you find that his thought was that Christianity had become just another moral compass, had just become another lifestyle that people could live on. They could glom onto it. They could say, praise the Lord. They could, you know, do all the Christianese. They could speak a certain way. They could um, have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, that was his point. And when he sort of says that when Christ came to give us the example, he wasn't coming to start another cult. He wasn't coming to start another religion where people take dogma and look at that dogma as this is the only way we're supposed to live. The Bible he sees as an example of someone living a unique true life. Why? Because God doesn't call uh, groups of people. God calls individuals. He speaks directly to you. You have a one-to-one -one relationship with God. In your one-to-one -one relationship with God, you might be in tune with someone else who has a relationship with God, but still it's a unique thing. If you think about maybe a relationship you have with a parent, and that parent might you know, be kind and good to both of you as children, to you and your sibling, but you still have an individual instance, an individual understanding of who God is and what is required for you in your life. And that is more important than you know what denomination you're going to be a part of or following which pastor because he says there you're just taking the things of life you're taking the aesthetic mode of life and bringing it into your life of faith and the example i'll give maybe this this might be an example that offends many people but i see like prosperity gospels like uh, people who sort of use god as a a motivational speaker of some sort that whatever you want whatever you call forth two or three shall be gathered here in his name and we shall ask for it and will be yes and amen in the name of Christ like in that mode what you're doing is trying to enjoy a certain type of life while clearing your conscience while sort of adhering to a life of faith so are you really engaging with uh, what it means to be someone who is living in this world but is not of this world when you're using that very faith to be supremely successful in this world to get all the things this world has to offer you sort of want all the things this world has to offer plus the things of the afterworld or you might be using it as an ethical stand and those are you know a lot of debates that hang on the letters that Paul wrote, the letters that people in the Bible wrote, and saying, this is it, God set a standard and has never changed beyond that point. But you yourself, have you spoken and found out if that's the case, if that's what you know you believe is the, the will of the Almighty Father? Who knows? Now, in my wrestling with these ideas, what I've found is that to move from being in the night of infinite resignation, as you remember what I was talking about, the infinite resignation is not quite the night of faith but you're on the path to be a true night of faith let me um read this out to you um 
Outwardly, it would be impossible to distinguish this person from the rest of the crowd. Yet inwardly, the man has made and at every moment is making a movement towards infinity. You rest yourself in the transcendent. You attain an ideal relation between both the infinite and the finite. The simultaneous maintenance of an absolute relationship with the absolute and a relative re relationship with the relative. You live in this world, but you're not of this world, and thus you're not dependent upon it. You can enjoy finite things and relationships without suffocating them with your desperate need for anxiety. You don't need your spouse, you don't need your job to fulfill you. You are already fulfilled. All these other things are just ways in which you're living in the finite needs that your body has, but they're not um, the end all be all of who you're supposed to be. The finite tastes just as good to this to him. Sorry, this is just me reading um, Kierkegaard again. The finite tastes just as good to him as to one who never knew anything higher, because his remaining infinitude would have no trace of a timorous, anxious routine, and yet has this security that makes him delight in it as finitude were the surest thing of all. He resigned everything infinitely, and then he grasped everything again by virtue of the absurd. He is continually making the movement towards infinity, but he does it with such precision and assurance that he continually gets finitude out of it, and no one ever suspects anything else. This is the thing, like you would only know that internally as a person. It's not something anyone else would ever know. Um, yeah, so if you think about um, everything we've said about becoming a knight of faith, it's very easy to see that person as deluded. I mean, you're living an absolute paradox. You're enjoying the finitude without it being necessary for it to fill up your state of anxiety, your, your state of desperation. You're grasping for the infinite uh, without letting go of the fact that you're also finite. You've made a choice, a commitment to a certain way of life, and that's what the religious mode is. Kierkegaard talks about all truth that really matters is subjective. Not to say that objective truth doesn't matter. Of course, scientific facts matter. They inform you know, the way we move about in the world. But the thing that matters is what's true for you. It is true that uh, being a doctor is a good thing. It's also true that being a teacher is a good thing. But for you in your life, only one of those truths makes sense. Either you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be a teacher. And when you find the one that works for you, that subjective truth is very powerful because it allows you to utilize those objective truths that are around you. Now, for those of us uh, godless heathens, I've been talking about faith a lot and spirit and all of those things. Um, there's a certain movement of people who think of this as thinking about the absolute, uh, an absolute idea, thinking about infinity without personifying it or providing a Christian standpoint towards it. Um, I'm not sure if that's you know, what Kierkegaard wanted, but at least for me, that's one of the ways in which I've chosen to interpret this and take it as a you know, sort of way of thinking about life. The other thing I'd want to mention is also um, around when you're making this leap of faith. Um, let, let me actually read it for you here. This is um, something I really want to make <laughs> clear. Uh, this is from The Sickness Unto Death. Whether you are a man or a woman, rich or poor, dependent or free, happy or unhappy, whether you bore in your elevation in the splendor of the crown or in humble obs obscurity, only the toil and heat of the day, whether your name will be remembered for as long as the world lasts or you are without a name and run namelessly in the numberless multitude, eternity asks you and every one of these millions of millions just one thing, whether you have lived in despair or not. If then, if you have lived in despair, then whatever else you won or lost, you have, you have everything. For you, everything is lost. Now the last thing I'll say on this is, despair is a teacher. It's meant to show you how you're out of work. It's very possible for you to lose yourself living in despair. Now the worst form of despair is when you do not know that you're in despair. And you might not know when you're in despair, like we spoke about in the last episode, by you filling your life with all these interesting things, these interesting distractions. If you watched uh, Bojack Horseman, one of the things um, 
uh, Mr. Peanut Butter says is, you know, life is meaningless. You just distract yourself with uh, meaningless things until you die. I think that's <laughs> one of the modes a lot of us pick. You just say, hey, let me just distract myself until I die. But once you know you're distracting yourself, you really can't keep distracting yourself. It only works if you don't know it's a distraction. But the minute you find that out, you're pressed with the issue of nihilism that we spoke about. Um, you're only engaged when you're doing those things of interest. But when you have those quiet moments, when life is at a lull, when necessity bears its teeth, you, you find yourself in a desperate urge to try and cling to something else, trying to run away from yourself, trying to run away from the responsibility of being a self. And that's the most terrifying place to be in when you cannot be who you are. You cannot stand to be who you are. You will run and throw your hands um, as Nietzsche says, the one who is desperately lonely uh, opens their heart too quickly to anyone else who shows some kindness. And that's the danger. Um, so to be, you know, I guess a person who is reconciling those two things as a person of faith, um, Kierkegaard thinks that you find that by committing yourself wholly to living in a relationship with the absolute. For him, the absolute is God. And the person of Jesus Christ was an emblematic example of going against just religion, of living true to what you believe you are, what you believe you're supposed to be. And when Jesus got arrested, I mean, this is one of the examples he gives, he didn't look any different from all the other men around him. He didn't seem spectacular. He was just, you know, they had to point him out and say, that's the guy. And this conception we have in our minds is that you'll be perfect and ideal. No, it just means that inside of you, you've found a peace and a quietness. You've moved beyond that despair. You've moved beyond that anxiety to accepting that being a human being is not completely removing the finite, is not completely distracting yourself from the infinite, but is finding a synthesis between those two and finding a mode of life that makes sense. And to me, I think that would be the best wish I could have for anyone who's watching this. It's a wish I have definitely for myself. And yeah, let's keep striving. I wish you all the very best as you go through your journey through despair and I'll see you next time.